thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone. I quite literally stand here today in my grandfather's footsteps, or about three and a half feet above them. He was an engineer who worked in these carriage works uh, about 60 or 70 years ago. And he would actually, they'd roll in the carriages, he'd rip the wheels off, he would turn them on a lathe out here, and uh, he would make them, the roll, fix the rolling stock and put them out on, out on the tracks. Um, he was an engineer, and I, I like to believe that what he was trying to do was make the future better for his son. Um, I'm very, you know, as an inventor, I'm super concerned about the future. I try to spend all day there every day. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, it's impossibly hard, and it takes forever to come. This is the problem with being an inventor. You, you, you can see the future, and there's just a lot of tedious work to get there. Um, I was probably inspired by this type of stuff that I read when I was a kid, because when I was a kid, the future was indeed going to be awesome. We were going to go here and you know, go to the moon. It was going to be tremendous. Uh, the, the guy on the left in this photograph who I'm embarrassing is somewhere in the audience. That's my father, Ross. Um, he was also an engineer. He worked on textiles for his entire career. Uh, he invented things like, remember when the annoying seams in socks went away? Um, he made better diapers and better tampons and worked on recycling textiles. And I like to think he was doing that because he, he had a vision for my future that was more awesome uh, than his. The little guy to his right is my son. And something amazing happened to me when I became a parent. I, I really got this thread of humanity that it is, it is sort of almost a fundamentally human condition to want the future to be better for your child than it was for yourself. And I think that was an easy thing for my father to sort of dream up, because we lived in the world of Tintin. But I, I worry for my son that we don't, we've lost a, a positive vision of the future. You might notice I have an interest in comic books. Uh, this is sort of a draft for a comic I'm working on with a wonderful fellow called Nick Dragotta. And this sort of sums up where we think the environmentalist movement is at, right? It's doom, it's gloom, you know, every, every, the, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. There is no positive vision for the future. Um, it, to paraphrase the environmentalist movement, if we try really, 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 really hard and we make lots of sacrifices, the future is going to suck a little bit less than it might otherwise. <laughs> Th thank you for that headline, Greenpeace. Um, I want to go back to this. I want to live in a future where I'm walking in zero gravity on the moon with a fishbowl in my head with my dog beside me, right? <laughs> that is an awesome future. I want to live in a future where I explore the oceans in a robotic shark, right? <laughs> This, this is what we need to do. And I think it's a, a collective failure of our imagination that we're letting ourselves believe that the future is going to suck. Um, you know, this, this was a future that drove a lot of us. Uh, this is the, an, obviously an image of the first steps on the moon. Um, the average age of a NASA engineer in the Apollo program that achieved this was 26. The average age of a NASA engineer now is 52. You shouldn't be surprised that we just flew the last space shuttle mission. So maybe this vision of the future isn't the right one, but I'm really interested in what is the amazing vision of the future that's going to motivate our children and ourselves to do awesome stuff. Now, this is something, I, a company I founded in California called Makani Power, and we are working on high altitude uh, wind power. So this is extracting the wind energy at heights that you can't reach with a traditional wind turbine. So what you're seeing in the video here is uh, absolutely awesome in my mind. So this is a highly glorified remote control air aircraft flying at about 200 miles an hour, missing the ground every eight seconds or so. And it's, this is generating about three or four kilowatts on each of the two turbines. So this whole wing is, is producing about eight kilowatts, so it could power eight or 10 homes. This is showing that we can fly in circles. So the, the only challenge between <laughs> This is actually a video from on the wing. Um, this is why you need an autopilot. So uh, any normal superhuman pilot would, pilot would black out in about three seconds, because this is pulling a constant 9G barrel roll. And to bring this technology to fruition, we need to do that constant 9G barrel roll for about 20 years. So the machine needs to last that long. So you need to miss the ground every time for 20 years. Uh, you might think that sounds impossible. Well. I'm now going to show you 24 hours of video that looks exactly like this, <laughs> where we show we can do it for 24 hours. Actually, to spare you that, I might get Jules to speed it up. But trust me, it works. 24 hours. We've only got another 19,976 to go. Um, so this, this, is, this is cool. This machine, when we finally build it, wants to be the size of a 707. 
Um, here's the engineers that are working on it. These are people from all over the world. Uh, we had Australians, Brazilians, Englishmen, a bunch of Americans, some Canadians, even a Kiwi on this team. Um, he knows who he is. He'll, he'll laugh at that, I hope. Um, <laughs> So this is where we are at now. This is getting steadily bigger. So this is now about a 20 kilowatt machine. But once we get this up to being about the size of a 707, this thing will produce one to three megawatts of electrical power uh, at a cost that should be below that of coal generated uh, electricity. And I believe you know, this type of thing, that is a future that is awesome, right? Huge kites flying in the sky generating clean electricity. That's the future I want to live in. Thanks. Um, actually, I, you know, just for, they, they hate me when I do segues because they think I'll go over time. But it was actually, I, I learned my passion for kites came from flying on Maroubra Beach in here in Sydney and sewing my own kites and almost killing myself in the early days of kite surfing. Thanks for tolerating that mum who is also in the audience. Um, so this is, I, I really got obsessed with energy, obviously, as you can tell. This is the picture of how we use energy today as humanity. We use about 18 terawatts of energy, broadly defined, primary energy. We need to do a clean energy uh, pretty quickly. So we've got to get, you can see it up there in the top right, uh, 18 terawatts of power. These are all the renewable energy sources. This is the one slide you need to remember. So in the top left hand corner, there's the moon. So if you extracted all the power in the tides, you only get three terawatts. That's not going to get us there. Um, same with coastal waves. If you extracted all of the waves so there's no more surfing, you only get one sixth of humanity's power supply. The reality is we use an enormous amount of power. Obviously, you see at the top there, solar energy, 85,000 terawatts, there's tons of it. Let's do a lot of that. Wind, you can see there's uh, about 400 uh, terawatts of wind at low altitude, but at high altitude, where we're going with Makani, there's about 3,600. So this is sort of the map of what is possible. Now, we're not doing a very good job of planning this clean energy future. Actually, we're doing a terrible job. So I'm going to use an analogy here. We actually, we used to politically and socially plan for the future pretty well. So this is obviously a map of the Sydney Basin. We use 1.4 billion litres of water per day here in, in the Sydney Basin, but only 36 million litres of water hit that land area. So we use 40 times more water than actually hits the land area. Someone planned better than this, and in fact, we drew from a much larger geographic area than the, the Sydney Basin. And you can see an area that extends to, extends to Lithgow and down to Canberra, and that actually is enough to collect the water for Sydney. It's going to be a similar challenge with uh, energy. So this is a physicist's map of the world. Um, it is square. So this represents the land, <laughs> this represents the land mass. You thought it was round, didn't you? Yeah, new result, just in. Um, <laughs> So as you can see, it's squared, 12,000 kilometers on a side, grossly. Uh, and you can see I've arranged it in terms of the land area size of every country in the world, from largest to smallest. Russia, China, Canada, USA, Brazil, Australia is the sixth largest. If you took an optimistic view of the renewable technologies we have, and you thought we would do 10 terawatts of power in a new country called Renewistan, um, it would actually be the world's seventh largest country, almost the size of Australia. So remember that we needed 18 terawatts for humanity. It means we need to do sort of continent scale engineering of our energy systems if we want to do it purely with renewables. That might mean you look more seriously at nuclear. It's distasteful at the present political moment to do so, but we should. But you know, when we used to plan for things, we would plan at, at large scales. We need to go back towards doing that. Uh, we're actually launching a, a, a project at the moment to do energy mapping for everywhere in the world, so I have data on everyone. So this is how Australia's energy was produced, 2007, 2008. This is called a Sankey diagram. Beautiful thing about a Sankey diagram is that any section, it is equal. And if I collapse those, this is an expression of the second law of thermodynamics that energy is conserved. So you'll see on the left there, that's all the primary energy we put in, in coal and oil and otherwise. And on the far right, that's actually how we use it. And on the far, far right, you can get a measure of the efficiency of our whole system. So you can see Australia is actually doing a pretty poor job, right? About 30% you know, uh, of the energy we put in on the left actually comes out as useful energy on the far right. And that's because of the fundamental inefficiencies of uh, oil and coal. So we need to fix that. Uh, here's actually the more complete view of Australia's energy future. Um, so now I have added the exports. 
So if you, if you can see here that Australia actually only uses 30% of the energy that we produce. We export 60 or 70%. As you can see, the majority of it is uranium and coal. So it's a little hypocritical that we don't do nuclear energy locally. We just export it to the rest of the world. The other thing that con would concern you here is we are not investing. It's like the, the Arab problem. They're using up all their oil. They're not investing it back in their own country very well. We should be taking these profits if we, had, if we were planning like we used to, and we should be using this to develop a domestic solar and wind energy industry. That, that would be an awesome future. Um, thanks. I get emotional on that. So here's another problem. I'm going to step you through sort of the, how our energy demand has grown over the last 30 years. We also have to consider whether or not we're going to continue to allow that to happen. So that's large scale energy. Now I also obsess about very small scale energy. So this is a bottle, a Coca-Cola product, a bottle of vitamin water. And on the right, on the left, you see the normal nutritional facts label. On the right, you'll see the consumption facts. So how much energy does it take to get this bottle to you? And they're, they're sort of approximately right, about four, four or five megajoules to get that into your hand to drink. Now this is the type of graph that a scientist makes. Awesome information, right? It takes about an hour to read. You should never show it on a TED stage. <laughs> this is from nature.com. And this is actually, what this says is, the percentage reductions by a certain date way of looking at climate change is wrong. On the right-hand side, this is the risk of going above, above two degrees. On the bottom level of the graph there, it's how many tons of carbon we can emit. There's a fixed known amount of carbon that we can emit before we have to stop cold turkey. If you actually use that more accurate way of looking at it, you can get a result something like this. For every you know, unit of energy like terawatt years of coal, you can figure out how much CO2 goes into the atmosphere. The useful thing there is you could take that bottle of energy, drink, ironically, vitamin water, and you could convert that into its impact as a discrete action in parts per million of CO2. 2 times 10 to the min minus 14 is a terribly small number, but it's still a number, and you can measure it. And I think this is really philosophically fascinating. We've entered the age of consequence. We can measure the impact of all of our acts. I'm a little obsessive compulsive. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the impact of every single action in my life, right down to my toilet paper and underwear. Flights are in blue. All my physical objects are in pink. My electricity is down there. Even my taxes in that sort of top right-hand corner. So you can measure all of these things. And then the easy answer would be, well, you should do none of those things and use no energy. Well, that's not really an awesome future. Um, <laughs> So that, you notice I was 18,000 watts. This is the, the, the picture per capita energy consumption in the whole world. As you can see, Australians are about 15th in that list. Americans are about 10th. I'm actually at 18 kilowatts. I was twice as bad as the Americans that I was pillaring, and I found out, even though I was running a wind energy company and I was a bicycle commuter, excuse my French, I was a planet fucking hypocrite. <laughs> um, these are, this is disturbing, right? I really thought I was the leader of the environmental movement. I was not. I was doing bad things to Gaia. Um, <laughs> these are countries that use less than 2,000 watts per person. The thing that's interesting here, China and India. So there's two, more than 2 billion people, and they're way below 2,000 watts. Um, I'm trying hard to go from my 18,000 watts to live at the world average, 2,200 watts. It's probably close to impossible. The good news is the first thing I do is stop paying taxes. That removes about 30%. <laughs> good news for you all. Um, but it makes you focus your mind on what you want to do in your life and how you want the future for you to look. It's not, not just a project of denial for me. It's how do I live on 2,000 watts and how do I live a whole lot better on 2,000 watts. As I was flying over here on the worst um, air flight I've ever been on, I was in the fetal position crying that I'd never see my two-year-old again with the turbulence. I was like, well, my life would have improved if I video conferenced to TEDx, and I would have saved a whole lot of carbon. And you know, that's the thing to say, maybe we don't need to do as much unnecessary travel as we do. So to finish with some cartoons and some optimism, here's the characters from our books, Howtoons. They're trying to figure out how to save, go uh, save gas. Here's this kid who's heard all those horrible headlines, and he realizes, an eight-year-old, well, I want the future to be awesome. Adults are failing me. I will have to save myself. Lies down in the bathtub, sinks in. Then you'll see some bubbles rising. Realizes that he can capture those things. 
shares the results of his research with his sister. She thinks it stinks, but at least he's trying and he's imagining biofuels and how awesome the future could be with biofuels. In this case, uh, he, start, he, he decides that, you know, the school bus is an outmoded way to get to school. How about zip lines? And decides to reinvent a future of zip lines. Now, you might think that is, that is a sort of flippant remark, but the reality is two of the most fuel efficient in terms of people, miles, travel, uh, technologies we have in the world for moving us around are zip lines and roller coasters. So if there's any eight-year-olds in the audience or people who'd like to be eight-year-olds, I can convince you that the future is going to be awesome because in the future, we will ride zip lines to school and roller coasters, right? We have an unbelievable failure of imagination. I want to leave you with that. Let's imagine futures where we actually just, we just do this. Sydney would be incredible. The monorail sucked. Zip lines. <laughs> Thank you very much.